Um, which brings me on to Professor Jenny Davis. Um, Jenny is going to give us a, um, an aquatic perspective on um, arid ecology, which is really great. Um, Jenny's from the Water Science Institute from uh, uh, Institute for Applied Ecology at University of Canberra. Uh, her research examines aquatic e ecosystems and freshwater biodiversity under multiple stresses, including climate change. She's worked on freshwater biodiversity and wetland management in all Australian states and in Malaysia, and holds data sets spanning more than 25 years for wetlands here in Central Australia and in Western Australia. She's recently completed a collaborative project to develop uh, guidelines for climate change adaptation for arid zone aquatic ecosystems. Please join with me in welcoming Jenny to the stage. I should have got you to put my um, talk up. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank ESA for giving me this wonderful opportunity to present um, some of our research. And just in case you're interested, that uh, photo was taken at Ormiston Gorge last year at sunrise. Um, I always like to start off with acknowledgements because I tend to get a brain fade near the end of a talk, especially a long one, and really the acknowledgements are probably the most important bit of the talk when it comes to um, keeping this research going because as, um, people, as anyone here who works in a remote location knows that without funding you, can, you just cannot do that field work. So I'm very grateful for the support um, provided in these, um, by NCARF and uh, ARC in particular, and for the support, support of the institutions and the agencies listed on this slide. I also want to acknowledge a lot of my uh, co-workers. Now, over the years, I've worked with many people, and they certainly aren't all named on this, this slide, but I particularly uh, want to bring your attention to these people who've been working recently on the arid zone projects I'm going to talk about. And uh, I want to say something special about Peter Latz up here in this top left-hand corner, because Peter was the person, uh, when I met him in Alice Springs in about 1983, and told him I was interested in water, he said, you should go down to the George Gill Range and look at the water down there. It's a well-watered area, it's really interesting. I came back in 1994 and spent five months in Alice Springs, and Peter was very generous, he, he, he gave me all the sites at which he'd been finding relic plants, I went out there and found relic insects. Uh, but I really think it was Peter who set me on the, the path that you're now going to hear about. So thank you, Peter. I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the sites that we've been working at. And I feel that this painting probably encompasses some of the complexity of understanding that these um, groups have. I haven't got time to go through and explain, and, of course, and I'm not, of course, I don't have the knowledge that, um, that is embedded in this water dreaming painting, but it's clearly about surface water, it's about rainfall, it's about the birds that will turn up and, and about hunting those birds. Uh, in preparing for this talk, I decided I'd better get out of my sort of narrow aquatic focus and read a bit more broadly. And these are the books that have uh, particularly influenced me in the last couple of months. I think, as Libby said yesterday, as an ecologist, reading Mike Smith's work on the archaeology of Australian deserts, I just really enjoyed it and gave me a much broader perspective. It's probably a bit cheeky um, acknowledging my own <laughs> book up there, um, but I want to particularly acknowledge my co-authors because it was the discussions that we had around groundwater and temporary aquatic systems when we were preparing the text for this book that I found particularly helpful. They also very uh, kindly decided that they liked this photo, another photo of Ormiston Gorge at sunrise, um, as the cover photo for this book. And I think it sends out a message globally that water in Australia is important and water in arid areas is particularly important. What I'm going to do is set the scene, uh, big picture with the arid zone, then I'm going to move down to talking um, about refugia, and then some of the results that we've been collecting, and then finally just touch on some issues and where I hope we might go in the future. So first of all, in terms of aridity, um, I think this image that I grabbed off the web a few weeks ago very clearly shows all the light areas here are arid areas. Australia is the largest arid area in the Southern Hemisphere, and it's been arid for a long time. Aridification um, has been happening over millions of years. And, um, it's not only that long time scale, of course, but the last glacial maximum was a particularly arid phase. 
But in the Northern Hemisphere, of course, it was glaciation that a lot of work on refugia has been done in relation to. In Australia, as Margaret Byrne and others pointed out, we need to be thinking about aridification. Some more facts and figures about the, and Margaret Byrne and others recognised this arid region as, as representing a truly arid biome. So it's large, um, precipitation, rainfall, the ratio of precipitation to potential evapotranspiration is low, less than 0.4. The rainfall, not only is rain scarce, but it's very variable, it's quite unpredictable. Not many people live in the arid zone, but economically it is really important to Australia. Um, uh, mining is particularly important and probably the Pilbara is generating a lot of that income, but um, pastoralism and tourism are also very important in, the in terms of income from the arid zone. In terms of aquatic systems, <coughs> I think this um, fairly early geofabric from um, BOM is, is really useful. Yes, there are plenty of rivers across Australia, but if you got here by flying and you looked out the window, you will see that most of those rivers in inland Australia are rivers of sand, punctuated occasionally by waterholes. So although we have uh, flowing systems down in the south, the southeast, the southwest, and a, a, quite a narrow strip across the top, most of our inland river networks do not flow permanently. And also we do not have any permanent standing water bodies. Lots of salt lakes, lots of clay pans, lots of temporary systems, but no permanent large lakes. Uh, so moving, that's the general picture. Moving into refugia, I want to mention this report produced by Steve Morton and others back in 1995, looking at um, uh, refugia and, uh, and the, dry, uh, the terms um, arid zone, dry lands, rangelands and the outback are all used interchangeably. So please forgive me if I move between them. I mainly talk, tend to talk about the arid zone. Um, but uh, they identified re refugia based mainly on endemics and relictual species, and they identified a number of important systems through the arid region, which are, are listed here. So I thought 20 years later, it's a good time to now go back and revisit this concept. So what I've got here, um, I guess, are the definitions of refugia that have really influenced me in the, in the way that we're going now. So the classical definition, um, I guess was described pretty well by Proven and Bennett back in 2008, and they were looking at it from a Northern he Hemisphere perspective, very much related to systems contracting back from much larger areas. And of course, examples coming from vegetation and glacial refugia in places like Southern Europe. Well, Margaret Byrne and others took up this, um, looked at this and said, look, this really doesn't apply to the Australian arid zone, uh, using uh, phylogenetic, information they suggested we've got much more, we've got small localised refugia and it's very dependent on the species which you're considering. Uh, Keppel et al then said yes, you know, important but we also need to be really, um, to be focusing on habitats when it comes to refugia and this definition is one that has influenced uh, me enormously, that sites which biota retreat to, persist in and then potentially move out from is I think for the arid zone and for changing environmental conditions, enormously important. But then that final definition that I've got up there on micro refugia is also important. So this came from Solomon Dabrowski working in Montana. So he was working on forests, but he said in terms of a changing climate, the thing that we really need to be looking at are those sites where the climatic processes are decoupled from the regional climate, because those are the sites, those are the refugia that will persist into the future. And he made um, the point that um, sites that are fed by groundwater in particular, that that's in fact an earth process. And so that's decoupled, usually on fairly long time scales from atmospheric processes. And that's what makes potentially sites fed by groundwater very important in, t in terms of looking at where these um, wet sites are going to be under a drying climate. So uh, based on Ke uh, Keppel's suggestions, we decided that we had to have a very clear idea of what the different types of aquatic habitats are in the arid zone. Um, I should say that it is well known that water in the arid zone is scarce. It's not an abundant resource, but there's a diversity of types of water bodies. And luckily, uh, we didn't have to start from scratch. Rod Fenchin and, and others had come up with a very nice typology for water bodies in the Eastern Lake Air Basin back in um, 2011 in biological conservation. So we took that um, typology and just expanded it to cover 
all the basic types of, of habitat, aquatic habitats across the arid zone. And in the table on the left, the thing I want to draw your attention to is not just recognising these different types of aquatic habitats, but knowing what their water source is. So whether they're mainly fed by groundwater or mainly fed by surface water, which in fact is rainfall, is very important. And so we took that information, different types of habitats, and then based on, on a big review of the literature said, right, there are two fundamental types of refugia that we recognise now for aquatic habitats in the arid zone. And the first of these, and from a management perspective, the one that I feel is the most important, is, is the ev evolutionary refugia. So these are permanent water sites and they are groundwater fed. And we came up with these sites, not only on the knowledge that they were groundwater fed, but on the species that inhabit these sites. So this is where relictual species and endemic species occur. So we've recognised subterranean aquifers, um, WA cast systems with tiger fauna are the, probably the best example of an evolutionary um, uh, system, uh, refugium, but we've also got the discharge or mound springs in the Great Artesian Basin and then outcrop springs. And Fencham made the point that the difference between discharge springs and outcrop springs is that discharge springs discharge uh, remotely from where the water recharges the, the aquifer. So this is the Great Artesian Basin where the water is recharging on the eastern side and most of the springs are on the western side. In contrast, Outcrop springs are where you've got very local aquifers, so quite small bodies of groundwater discharging at the surface. And I've just given a mound spring and um, serpentine gorge are two good examples of these different types of groundwater fed systems. So this is what we based our information on, a large amount of published material, and I'm very grateful to the people who undertook very detailed molecular studies to produce the work that we could then come in and do this form of meta-analysis on. And there's a, there's a time scale here. So where we, <coughs> where we found where short range endemics occur, these really are the oldest sites in time. So these subterranean aquifers and the mound springs. Where we're tending more to get relic species, vicariant relics, um, which have populations in the most case in southeastern Australia that have been cut off by drying, um, not quite so old. Of course, it's all relative. I mean, going back to the last glacial maximum is still quite a long time ago, but not on geological time scales. So that's just giving you some background to how we came up with our uh, evolutionary refugia. Um, just some more information, and I think this aerial image of the bubbler in uh, northern South Australia really sets, gives you a good visual picture of what these sorts of refugiums, refugia look like. So that is an incredibly arid landscape, but water is bubbling to the surface, and then as it runs down, a, a small wetland is formed, and then it will just run out and evaporation will take over. So the kind of fauna that you will get in these, um, these in the mound springs, fish, desert gobies, snails, and then the, uh, the remaining three groups there are micro crustaceans. Now, none of these organisms can fly. So they really can't move around the landscape. So they're very vulnerable to losing that habitat. And the thing that will uh, have the worst impact for them is if that habitat dries out. So in this case, um, the the, and uh, the, uh, the fauna is, is very susceptible to population extinctions because they don't have that ability to move back in. Uh, this is an example of one of the sites that I've uh, been working on. Um, so this is right at the top of Serpentine Gorge. In this case, we have a completely different fauna. It's a relictual fauna. It, it's uh, insects with Gondwanan affinities. And these are capable of flight, but only short range flights. So mayflies in particular only live for a couple of hours. They're not gonna make it across the large distances that now separate them from sites in, say, Victoria. This, the fauna associated with evolutionary refugia, I suggest are typical of a fauna you would say has resistant strategies. They do quite well. The conditions can change quite a bit. There's some flexibility there. But if that habitat they're in disappears, they disappear and they can't come back. Now that contrasts with ecological refugia. And these are the systems that do vary in space and time. So the water comes and goes. These are rainfall dependent, and it could be local rainfall or it could be rainfall far up in the catchment that sends a flood through. So, and, and whether, how you decide on whether something is an ecological refugia or refuge is um, really depends on the fauna that you're looking at or the 
Flora, you're looking at, how close waterholes might be and how much hydrological connectivity you've got. So Justin Costello and Catherine Russell have uh, very recently published a paper in Echo Hydrology that are working on um, waterholes in the rivers in the Western Lake Air Basin. And they've said if a, a waterhole is deeper than four metres at cease to flow, then it's probably going to make it through to the next rain, which could be up to two years away. So, so those deep systems in, in those sorts of river systems are very important. Um, ecological refugia, aquatic systems in the arid zone are the classic boom and bust systems. So when the water contracts, everything dies back. And then when there's water there, everything flourishes. But uh, the key thing is that for systems, at least in river networks, that the floods are essential for moving things around the landscape. Because they're so dependent on rainfall, then these systems are very vulnerable to a drying climate. The organisms that inhabit these systems, I consider, have really good resilient strategies. So they can collapse, but they've got strategies to return when the conditions are good. And finally, I just want to mention, I've been talking about water, but we also need to remember that dry sediments are also refugia. So these, this is because they have the seed and egg banks. And so when you get rain in a place like this, a clay pan, or a salt lake, and things, things can then um, hatch, emerge, and they fuel that burst of productivity that then supports things like um, water birds. In this case, local rainfall is very important. Um, and talking to you here, I don't think there's anyone in this audience who would say, well, actually, we didn't already know that. But I've been quite surprised when I've been talking to, I guess, members of the wider community that they have no concept of this seed egg bank thing. A dry lake is often considered to be a dead lake and sediments are con often considered to be purely inorganic material. And I think particularly with um, issues like mining, we need to make sure that we get this message across that the dry sediments can be quite important refugia. How many refugia are out there? Well, um, we don't have extensive mapping of aquatic sites across the arid zone, but there's one piece of work that's been done that I regard as being extremely important. And that was a survey done by Jenny Silcock, where she went out and ground truthed an enormous number of sites in the Eastern Lake Air Basin. And this is the information that she came up with. It's all mapped, it's all available on the web. web and I would, I would love to think that we could have this kind of mapping done across the entire arid zone. What I want to talk to you now is some work that we've been doing. So we did this very large lit review. We came up with different types of refugia. And then we said, well, from the perspective of, aqu of aquatic invertebrates, you know, we've been working at um, sites within the arid zone. We have not, not done a comprehensive study across the arid zone. Now, we didn't have enough money to go out and do um, a specifically designed survey of aquatic groups across the arid zone. But what we do have now is a, is a number of sites, um, which have been um, a number of studies, sorry, which have been carried out with similar enough methods for us to say, well, let's put that together and do effectively a meta-analysis. And I've just added the names to the sites here, so you can be more um, aware of where they are. So a very large study done in the, in the Pilbara. Um, I've been involved in work in the Central Ranges, work over in the Dryland Rivers region, and uh, work from the Great Victoria Desert Rockholes and Mount Springs Lake Air South. And I've got a table here which just gives you a few more details. So the Pilbara has been extensively sampled, 75 sites over a number of years by Adrian Pinder and others, working uh, back in DEC, uh, when it was called DEC in WA. And then the, most, the other most extensive study is undertaken by Nick Murphy in the um, Mount Springs south of Lake Eyre, so in one of the, the very driest regions of Australia. The other studies, we've got fewer sites, uh, fewer sampling occasions. But all on aquatic invertebrates collected by similar methods. So this is some, some of the results that we've got. So st and we could only work at the level of family, um, different uh, people identifying things that wasn't gonna work at the level of species. And as Jane Brimbox pointed out in her talk, for the central ranges, which is the area that I've been involved in, we only have positive descriptions for about 50% of the aquatic fauna. Um, so working at the family level was much safer. And the first, Thing that comes out here is very tempting to say that this is a latitudinal gradient, which makes sense that diversity increases as you get towards the tropics, very well established in terrestrial and marine ecosystems. However, we do know that there's a certain amount of confounding in the data. So we had the most number of sites sampled up in the Pilbara, but then the second most number was down in the Mount Springs, right down there with a very low number of, of taxa. 
Uh, we created rare faction curves, so we don't feel there was a big difference in sampling intensity, but certainly in terms of sampling area, the Pilbara is way out in front. There's also the fact that there's some confounding with habitat. For the rock holes in the Great Victoria Desert and the mound springs in, at Blake Air South, they are the only types of aquatic habitat in that region. So we, I don't think we're going to be able to improve upon this kind of result greatly by going out and doing some more sampling. Um, so that's richness at the family level, aquatic invertebrates. Now I want to show you fa uh, family uh, composition. Uh, of aquatic communities. And as Barb Down said in her talk, you're not a freshwater ecologist if you don't put up an ordination. So this is my ordina ordination for this talk. Um, so this is based on the composition of, of the families. And what you can see here, and, and I guess what we predicted is that there would be great fidelity to region, that there are big dry areas between all of these regions, and you would predict um, things are going to cluster pretty closely. In fact, that's what we're seeing, this cluster here, um, quite nice, tight clustering there, but then we've got this whole sort of quite, what I'd call, I guess, a data cloud. These are all riverine sites clustering together. And then we've, what we can see here is a huge amount of variability in the rock holes and the mound springs. And I've tried to, I guess, illustrate that by setting it up like this. So that tight smear of sites in fact, goes all the way across the arid zone, but it's the sites that are in river networks. A mixture of permanent and um, uh, temporary, and also a mixture of ev evolutionary and uh, ecological sites. And um, distinctly different, but still all riverine sites. And then the other slide is where I've uh, highlighted the isolated water bodies. So these are not within river networks. They're not connected up by floods or anything. So it makes sense they're much more isolated and it's probably fairly random as to what species turns up at a particular rock hole at any particular point in time. Um, but by looking at things across the entire arid zone, I feel we've now got much more information than we had when we were just doing our individual studies at in particular regions. So just to summarise this data, latitude and geographic region, I think, are important when it comes to the, aquatic con uh, the invertebrate component of biodiversity at these sites, and the composition is much more variable at isolated sites than riverine sites. What does that mean? Well, it means that hydro hydrological connectivity is important, even in systems that very rarely flow. Um, I was a postgraduate student at the University of Tasmania back in the 1980s when the Franklin Dam was a big issue and I was a foundation member of the Wilderness Society and I'm still a member of the Wilderness Society. And the whole story with no dams was what occupied our thoughts for quite some time then. That, that concept is still sitting here. Lurking in the background, I think, is still an immense push that we should be damming some of these dryland rivers. That They do get huge episodic rainfall events and the thought is, why are we letting that water go to waste? If we do end up going down a path of damming these dry land rivers, we are going to change the biodiversity in those systems enormously. I should say, and I shouldn't miss out saying here, for, of course, for the mound springs, it's not dams that are the issue, it's over extraction of groundwater, either for mining purposes or for pastoralism. I don't want to uh, leave you with the feeling that rock holes are not important. As a, as in terms of biodiversity, I couldn't go out and justify the conservation of any single rock hole based on the aquatic invertebrates that were present in that system. But of course, that's only one value. And the value of rock holes to humans has been enormous. So Aboriginal communities relied on these uh, rock holes, and Rod Fensham and others have pointed this out in their paper. Um, as enormously as the only sources of permanent water across arid landscapes. And I think Ian Bailey has produced, as far as I can tell, the only review that's been done on these systems, rock holes and soaks and things in the arid zone. And I just have to add a thing here as an academic who's been beaten about the head um, in terms of publishing in high impact journals for the ERA. I would say if Ian hadn't published this um, paper in the Journal of the Royal Society of Western Australia, we would all be much the poorer, that this information is really useful. The illustration here, that five centimetres, is the scale for this uh, map. This was drawn, it was a photograph of a map on a spear thrower of a Pinterby man, and it's showing the locations, the stylized locations of all the rock holes in the area that they would have been moving through. Really important information if you're relying on that water for survival. <clears throat> 
What I want to do now is move into talking about likely future refugia. So this is um, the concept that we brought up in this paper that we published in Global Change Biology back in 2013. And there we said the likely future refugia are going to be these uh, evolutionary refugia that are groundwater fed. So groundwater itself uh, means that you've got a fair degree of hydrological buffering because um, you're not, that groundwater has been stored from some rainfall event in the past. In the terms of Great Artesian Basin, it's a rainfall event that was a very long time in the past. With local aquifers in the ranges, it might perhaps be 100 years ago. There's also a degree of thermal buffering with groundwater because that water is stored within the soil and it's coming out to the surface at a very constant temperature. For some of the sites, we also know that there's a degree of shading that also offers some, some thermal buffering. So that's what we wanted to look at more closely. There's an amazing lack of, actual, of field data that we could go to. So of course, the obvious thing that we realised we needed to do was start to collect some of our own data. So we've done that at Penny Springs. So what I want to do now is take you from Alice Springs up here down to Wataka National Park, George Gill Range. You might know it more as the site of Kings Canyon. So about halfway on the tourist trail between Alice Springs and Uluru. So Penny Springs is the site that we chose and we chose, it's an evolution refugium and we chose it purely because it's the easiest site to get to. And believe me, it's not that easy. So <laughs> the rest are much harder. Uh, beautiful fresh water, fresher than what would have come out of your tap this morning in Alice Springs. So this is the site that we've instrumented. So we've uh, put in uh, various instruments. So, so uh, over on the left is Jane Brimbox and Ian Kidd erecting the um, weather station. We've got a web camera, a uh, solar panel. Now we knew because this is a shaded site, we might run into problems with enough light on that solar panel and sure enough we did. I'll tell you that, that more in a moment. The web camera, we could actually have live streaming from that site, but we can't afford to pay for it. We have one image come in to, uh, per day that we can access on the web. And at the moment, we're actually just using it to track the change in water because it's such a shallow water body. It's, it's probably the best way to do it. We've also, because I was worried about the um, losing light on the solar panel, we've also got little um, temperature buttons in the water and that's marked by that yellow X. And we, so we've got one in the water and one un, in the shade under the cycad, only about 20 centimetres away. And this lower photo is of Jane and Paul Sunnex putting in the wildlife cameras. So these are cameras that are triggered by movement. So that's down in Penny Springs. And then we put a weather station up on the ridge above Penny Springs, so up on Wataka Ridge. So that's the WR there. I think it's an impressive structure, but when you're up in a helicopter, you virtually cannot see it. I had to ask the pilot to tell me where it was to take the photo. It's so small on the scale of things. You can see the difference between the Penny Springs site and uh, the Wataka Ridge site, probably only a kilometre, but it's completely vertical. It actually, to walk from one to the other takes about two hours. Uh, what's happening with data? Well, the, the uh, weather station up on the top has been working really well. We've got plenty of sunlight, so it's got plenty of power, but we lost two months of data and that was a satellite issue and our provider um, didn't get onto it quickly enough, which as a scientist I find really unsatisfactory, but we won't go there. Um, in terms of Penny Springs, well, the camera has been working pretty well. We've had ongoing issues with the, uh, the weather station, so we've had to move the solar panel back out a bit. I'm hopeful when we go back down next week, we will have solved the final last problem, and that will now be data coming into the web at hourly intervals. The temperature loggers have been working really well, and so have the cameras. So what I want to do now is show you some of the data from um, Penny Springs. So first of all, this is the little temperature logger that's in the water at Penny Springs. So we started off in December. And I was quite, uh, sorry, in the air. I was quite surprised. It was still quite warm. It was quite warm down there, 40, over 40 degrees down in that little shaded site in um, late December, early January. It wasn't cool at that point. However, things did start to cool off and the, the, two, uh, the two dips there, these were rainfall events that came through. So lots of cloud cover. But then as time has gone on, so we've only got nine months started so far, but it gives us a contrast between summer and winter, which is why I'm showing it to you. Um, things started to, in fact, the variability in temperature started to, to narrow right off um, until now we're through into, into winter. Now, what I'm going to do is overlay the water temperature. Sorry. So that's the water temperature from the, say, from the little hobo logger, which is really only 10 centimetres away in the water. And you can see it's incredibly stable, which is what you would predict, but we've now actually got the data. So it's sitting at around 21 degrees, even when things were way up in the, uh, in the 40s. And of course, it's, it's now warmer through the winter months. 
So I get really excited about this data. Other people I've shown it to haven't seemed quite as excited, but never mind. So long as there's one of you, it's enough. What I want to do now is just compare the air temperatures down in Penny Springs with up on the ridge. So this is the, what I was showing you before was hourly data. This is daily data. So it's the maximum and minimum. You can see there was, um, uh, there's a lot of variability <clears throat> and that variability actually has decreased over the course of the year. Then we added the Wataka Ridge. So this is in red and you can see where the data is missing from here. And to begin with, there wasn't a lot of difference between the ridge and down in the Penny Springs. But as, to, as as we move through summer, in fact, sometimes there could be up to a 10 degree difference in the air. So it is, a, it is cooler and we haven't quite worked out why it's possibly to do with the angle of the sun and shading. And, uh, and certainly even through into winter, it's staying warmer up on the top, I guess as you would expect. Then we wanted to see, well, how does this compare with the data coming in from the BOM website for Alice Springs Airport? Have we just wasted an enormous amount of time putting this equipment out? So we added the uh, data, maximum and min, from Alice Springs Airport. This is beginning to look like a dog's breakfast at this point. But um, the ridge, Alice Springs Airport, Daily Maximum and Wataka Ridge are tracking each other fairly closely. Not quite as close with the minimum temperatures, but just to make life a bit easier, we've smoothed it out. We've gone for monthly temperatures and we've got the maximum minimum monthlies from Alice Springs. And then we've just put the, the means of our two sites and the water. And you can see they are bounded by what's coming in. And over time, it might be that we can extrapolate from the bomb data. But we still need to keep this going for some time. Um, in addition to this having, I believe, enormous research value, there's also another value for this kind of data. And um, I'm hopeful that um, the rangers at Wataka will in fact have a digital display of the data being collected uh, from hourly data coming down from the ridge in the, in the car park at Kings Canyon in time for next summer. Because there's an enormous safety issue, particularly in summer when tourists might fly in from Europe, it might have been minus 10 degrees C, they go up the top of the canyon, it could be 40 degrees plus. That's heart attack material. It's a safety issue. So if people can actually see the temperature, and the rangers would prefer they don't go up on the rim once it's got to 30 degrees. Certainly if it's 30 degrees at 10 o'clock, it will be well over 40 by um, early afternoon. So in, 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 um, although I think the data is enormously important from a research perspective, if it's also being used for a park management, um, if it has a park management function, um, then I think this will justify keeping this data going um, through time. And my personal goal is to try and keep this going for a decade. And I'm hoping that this kind of partnership is the way that you can achieve um, this kind of outcome, particularly when funding is so tight. I also, I don't want to give you the impression it, when I talk about evolutionary refugia that these are static sites, that they're somehow just sitting there, never changing. In fact, they're in the arid zone, things are highly variable, there are fires, there are floods and there are, there are droughts. And I'm hoping these images will give you some indication of just how extreme these things can be. So when we first sampled Penny Springs back in 1986, you can see lots of vegetation. And then the, the only fire that I know of, and these are photos provided from the rangers down at Wataka, went through in 2002 and it burnt right up to the rock face. So the ferns and the cycads were absolutely toasted. The fig disappeared. Um, <clears throat> but when we went back in 2008 to sample the aquatic system again, you can see that things like the cycads and the ferns had all come back. We got absolutely no change in the species that we found in the water. And this has now been published in a paper led by Jane Brimbox in uh, Marine and Freshwater Research this year. So really quite robust sites when it comes to it. And the other thing, of course, I don't have any um, information on floods, but back in 1872, Ernest Giles was there at a very wet time and he actually saw a waterfall at Penny Springs. This, there's a lot of poetic license in this sketch. It's, I think it's actually the next creek line to the site where we've instrumented. It doesn't quite fit the topography, but it, right next door, it does fit. So there was enough water there to have a waterfall and to happily have a swim in. I, I, hope, that I, uh, I, hope, to, I hope I get to see a waterfall at Penny Springs. The other thing that we've done is, uh, is now got data coming in from wildlife cameras. And any of you who've used wildlife cameras will know that you can collect a very large number of images very quickly. And then the real issue is, how do you actually process that information? So I'm not going to give you information that has in any way been processed. At the moment, all we're managing to do 
is get a species list for what's coming in to the site. And having always been so focused on water and what's in the water, this has been a real eye-opener to me to see just how important this water is to a whole lot of other species. And of course, when we're there, we're clomping around, we're making a lot of noise, virtually nothing comes in while we're there. So this has all been picked up by cameras. Um, so we had one camera sitting down on this, uh, looking across this pool and a number of others in the cycad. So I'm just going to run through what we picked up on those cameras. So the usual suspects, lots of zebra finches or ninny, um, coming in quite often, particularly during the hotter months. Diamond doves would also be there and they would quite often be there with the zebra finches. They seem to be quite happy to be in there drinking together. Uh, frogs at night. And we had no concept that there were frogs there. We didn't hear them calling and uh, we saw no tadpoles in those pools, but there were tadpoles in the pools much further down. So clearly the frogs are making their way up the system to sit amongst the nice damp ferns. Uh, a raptor, I think it's a brown cosawk, uh, would come in um, using it as um, uh, his, I think it might be him, personal water bath. And in fact, he spotted the camera lens. And a number of birds can pick up the lens. Presumably it looks like the eye of some form of threat or competitor. Um, a western bowbird turned up quite often and occasionally he looked to, appeared to have his wife and a chick with him and we actually found the bow further down the, the streamline. And he also appeared to know that there was a camera there. Uh, a heron came in. Now normally I'd associate, associate herons with fishing. There are no fish at all in uh, Wataka in the George Gill range, but of course there are plenty of frogs. So um, this heron was probably after frogs and perhaps the bigger aquatic invertebrates. Unfortunately, a cat turned up. So there is a cat moving through that area. And then finally, um, a young dingo, a young male dingo was coming in to drink quite often. And uh, it, I just thought, you know, these sites are so important and actually that hadn't been our focus, but um, hopefully with the cameras we've set up and we've set them up at some temporary sites at well, we'll start to get a handle on faunal use and particularly to relate it to um, environmental conditions. Well, I've been, uh, I've been talking to you about tools that I could, never, I could only dream about 20 years ago, GIS, satellites, telemetry. I also want to mention the, val the enormous value that molecular ecology can now uh, offer us in, in looking at connectivity in particular between populations as well as phylogenetic information. So we currently have two PhD projects, so Ash Murphy and Emma Rising, and they've both got posters out here, which hopefully you might have seen. And also Amy Smith did an honours project. So results are still coming in from the molecular work, but um, preliminary results uh, so far, at least with the insects, I, I guess support what we thought might be happening, that big flying insects like dragonflies and aquatic beetles, um, the entire arid zone, the, it, they are represented by metapopulations. They're moving around the entire arid zone. It's the weakly flying species that are much more likely to be, um, to have, a, there's much more variation between populations. And in fact, it looks as though we might be, there might be cryptic species there. So speciation is beginning to occur. So that's work in progress. And that is the um, Diplocodes hematodes, the lovely red dragonfly that you will see very often out in this landscape. The male is a nice bright red one. The female is not quite as bright tends to be yellow, gold. The other piece of molecular work that I've been particularly interested in is work done by um, Arlene Butwell with Jane Hughes at Griffith University. So Arlene did her PhD on water pennies. Now this was the group that I worked on for my PhD. But at that time, 30 odd years ago, I was only using morphometric characteristics. So Arlene has taken it the next step. And for the populations that she sampled in Central Australia, she found that the Two populations in the West Max, so Giles Spring and Upper Serpentine, in fact, um, uh, have very little genetic variation, but then quite a lot um, with the site Stokes Creek, which is quite close to Penny Springs down at Wataka. So she suggested that this is probably represents about 74,000 years since that the area between the two ranges was much more humid, so that these little beetles could have been flying around the landscape using damp places. So I thought of thought it might be the last glacial maximum, but Arlene's now pushed it back to 74,000 years ago. So really good information coming out. Oh, I just meant to say their t the larval beetle is just that tiny little black smudge at the end of that finger. So very unprepossessing insects, but a, a good story to tell us. 
Uh, there's also other molecular work going on. Now, I don't want to get into the debate about what's going on with palms at Palm Gorge, but some of you may have been aware of it when you visited there yesterday. But uh, what I would like to see now is this type of work done on some of the other uh, flora, so particularly the relic ferns and the mosses at some of these sites where we've been turning up uh, relic insults would be, I think, um, great information to have. And then uh, not long ago, Jane Brimbock said to me, Jenny, you, you've had a very pr privileged research life. You've only ever gone to the really good sites, very well protected in national parks. You need to come out and see some of the trash sites. So off we went. And this is Ilpeli Springs, so it's about 200 kilometres west of Papunya. And this was an important site, both culturally, apparently there's a misdreaming associated with it. It was a closed canopy Melaleuca spring where people traveling through the country would go in to get some coolness in the middle of the day. Camels have got in there. They've completely trashed the Melaleucas. Those are just the remnants you can see there. Fire's gone through. It's now invaded with buffalo grass and there are still decomposing carcasses of camels. So even though the camel pressure has now been reduced, there's still this issue of degraded water and how do you restore these sites? And the Papunya Rangers are now actively thinking about how they're going to restore them. But um, fencing isn't going to do it here, as Jane pointed out in her talk. Possibly offering alternative water sources might be a good start with keeping ferals back out. So not all refugia are in good condition. There's lots of work that we need to do, particularly in terms of restoration. And so this brings me to the issues that I want to mention and what I'm calling death by a thousand cuts. And the first one is of aquatic systems. So it's that the water may still be there, but it's so degraded. It's no longer going to be a value to the kind of wildlife that I showed you on those, those pics. Um, in this case, this is Willy Wally Creek upstream of Hope Downs Mine in the Pilbara. It's a cattle uh, it's a pastoral lease, so cattle have free access, access into this site. And you can see there's a lot of disturbance of the dry sediments, but in addition to that, there's a lot of nutrients going in, there's a lot of algae. Once things get really hot, you'll get uh, cyanobacteria, so you'll have algal toxins. The risk of botulism goes up enormously. So this ends up becoming water that is just of no use to the, to the fauna that normally would depend on it. And this is happening at water bodies across the entire Arizona, and I'm sure everyone here has probably been stood on the edges of something that looks this green or greener. In addition to that, of course, so the elephant in the room in the arid zone is mining. And um, this is a Google Maps image, and this is a uranium mine in the middle of Lake Way in Western Australia. Geosciences Australia brought out a report um, late last year on the resources associated with salt lakes across the Australian arid zone, and they listed um, potash, which is used in fertilizers, boron, which is used in a lot of pharmaceutical uh, products, including the toothpaste that we probably all used this morning, lithium, which is now, of course, in incredible demand for lithium ion batteries, and finally, uranium, which if you went to Corey Bradshaw's talk, you will uh, think that there may be an increase in demand for uranium. So it's not only the fact that um, salt lakes, I suspect, are you know, going to come much more now into, into uh, the vision of places to mine. It's not just the, the mine, and often mines are just a point source impact. They're very localised. But quite often it's the exploration activity that goes on before that mine is opened. And even here, oh, sorry, I want to go back. Even here you can see a lot of these tracks are not just people hooning around salt lakes, as they often do but these are, these are very regular, so they were probably exploratory transects. Um, so yes, a plea that we, we understand very little about the systems. The, the possibility now, using metagenomics, to go out there and, and get barcoding of systems all the way across the arid zone is now there. We just actually have to start doing it. Um, these dry systems are often dominated by microbial communities. In the past, it's been very difficult to characterise microbial communities. Apparently, you can only culture about 1% of the species that are actually in these systems. But with, uh, with metagenomics, not only will we get the species that are present, uh, prokaryotes as well as eukaryotes, but potentially we'll also get some indication of function, at least of microbial species. So to me, this is one of the new tools that um, I'm hoping that we're going to start using on a national basis. The, uh, the final slide that I want to put up is, is uh, I'm using a graphic here from um, a very recent report uh, produced by Steve Morton and others on biodiversity. And it's such a nice colorful image. I thought, right, this will be a good one to finish with because again, I want to take you back and remind you of just how 
extensive the arid zone is. It's a large part of Australia and we should be looking after it better. We should be understanding the processes that are occurring in the arid zone much better than we do. So I would like to think that we will be able to set up and what we should call, I guess, from a wider community perspective, an outback research hub that would allow us to take a more strategic, coordinated and national approach to what's happening across the arid zone. I was incredibly disappointed last Thursday when the NEST guidelines were um, announced and there was absolutely no scope, as far as I could tell, within those guidelines for an outback program. So I think this is something that we need to work on and I'm hoping that in the following session, uh, the discussion that will be led by Steve Morton at the end of that, I think this is something that we should be discussing. Thank you. I'll finish there. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions, so who would like to ask a question? We'll have a, ri a roving mic or two, so please, please wait for the roving mic to come. Angela. Thanks. I'm curious about your um, flightless invertebrates that you've got. I'm wondering if there's any chance that the eggs might be uh, undergoing long distance dispersal, maybe on some of those birds and things that were visiting your sites. Uh, certainly there's some information I didn't show you because I didn't want to make this too data intensive and I wasn't sure how long it would take me to explain things. But we, did, we have looked at traits, so we've looked at passive dispersers, which are the things that move around the landscape by wind or water birds, um, uh, aquatic obliquity. Uh, obligate aquatics, so things that can only move around via water. And then we've got weak, disperse, weak aerial dispersers and strong aerial dispersers. And the things that are turning up in the mound springs, um, they, they have no life history phase that can be moved around the landscape. There might be some very incidental movement. Some of the springs are in complexes, so they do move, they can be moved by floods within the complex. Um, but if they, if that water dries out, the only way they would be moved back to that spring is if, if we got a bucket and transferred them. And, and people occasionally say that that's possible, but on a large scale, of course, it's not possible. So we are looking at dispersal traits as part of the work we're doing. More questions? It's always a bit scary. Either it's all been incredibly simple or it's... No one understands anything I've said. <laughs> Hello. Um, you warned about the um, pressure on damming and cutting off the flows. Um, if you walk that through in an evolutionary timescale, would you be creating new evolutionary refuture? Um. Because you put dams in and created new sites of standing water, I doubt it because what you tend to do is get a much more homogenous fauna in those kinds of systems. So you get the things that can cope with, I mean, deep water is so different to the kind of water you get out here anyway. These are very shallow bodies of standing water. The kind of deep water that you would put in with a dam um, has a completely different set of physico-chemical characteristics. There'd probably be fish in there, which completely changes the structure. I mean, there are fish in these systems as well, but there would be the deep water fish. There'd be stratification. I don't think I could ever advocate that a major dam would in any way end up um, being a surrogate or a substitute for the sort of biodiversity that you currently get in these arid zone pool, uh, river pools. Jenny, you mentioned fencing's not a good option for degraded wetlands in remote areas. Just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and if you've got more thoughts on conservation strategies for those kind of areas. Fencing. Um, again, I'm, uh, I'm going back to Jane Brimbox's work where she showed that camels could actually knock over fences pretty easily if they wanted to get at the water. The other thing that would concern me, again, from the wildlife camera data, is, is just things like dingoes and the things that need to, to, you know, euros at some spots, the things that need to get access to the water that are fenced particularly, the wildlife, the, the native wildlife that would be, you know, kept out as well. Um, I think the Papunya Rangers have put in a little turkey nest dam that a boar's going to fill and apparently camels will go, if, if there's an easy water source, they won't bother tracking up the creek line to the difficult one. Um, but of course, just how easy it is to offer alternative water sources, whether you're going to start drawing down the little local aquifer that might be supporting the spring is another issue. I, don't, I see it as one of the great challenges 
for protecting water sites in the arid zone. Thanks, Jenny. That was a fabulous talk. I was really interested in the Ilbilba um, area, the waterhole that you had there with problems with camels. There's some fantastic photos of that in 1931 because the it was used as an airport and the only way to get fuel to the airport was with camels. So if you want, there's a whole set of fabulous photos taken by Philip Crosby Morrison and they're in the State Library of Victoria and they're all 1931 and including um, Aboriginal people setting up shelters for the people coming in. That's great. I think actually Jane Brimbox had um, already mentioned that she might work on those with the Aboriginal, the Papunya Rangers. Um, yeah, so, but yeah, I neglected to mention them. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, Jenny. Um, you mentioned water holes where you can go and drink better water than you can get here in Alice. That doesn't surprise me. Um, I guess I, I just wanted you to uh, comment on the added complication for conservation that there is of the great range in salinities and, and water quality, or not necessarily quality, but water types found in many of these water holes as well. Um. Sorry, do you see that as a, a, a problem for conservation or you, you're saying that there is quite a diversity there that we need to be aware of? And if we're going to conserve these systems, we've got to conserve that diversity yes, of, certainly of the, um, water types. You know, there are water holes in the Fink that really concentrate up with, as evaporation takes over. So ecological refuges potentially can have quite varying water quality. They can, they can start off quite fresh after a recent rain and then become quite salty, which is why you need those floods to go through so that things that have done the susceptible species and, and there's uh, indications that there's, you know, um, sort of a differential die off. So it's only things like spangled perch, I guess, that are sitting there at the end. The really tougher species can survive the low oxygen and the high salinities. But once that system gets reset, once you get good rainfall somewhere in the catchment and that flood comes through. So it's that variability that we need to maintain. You can see some pretty manky water holes. I think people may have seen some yesterday. Um, that's part of the natural process, but of course it's made worse if you've got cattle, if you've got ferals going in there and adding nutrients through droppings and that. But yeah, no, keeping, keeping that variability there for ecological refuges is what it's all about. I should say evolutionary refuges can also be ecological refuges, but it doesn't work the other way around. Any comments on refugia and tenure? Uh, in pr protection, layer, protected area status. Uh, well, amazingly, I think all the um, evolutionary refugia aquatic sites that I'm aware of in Central Australia are either in parks or on Indigenous protected areas. In the Pilbara, talking with Adrian Pinder, there's a lot of sites in the Pilbara that haven't been mapped. Um, I suspect the same is even in the Flinders that we, I mean, mapping is not um, a, a popular activity. It's often just considered to be stamp collecting in some ways. But unless we know where these sites are, we're not going to be able to manage them. I think that's the bottom line. Thanks, Jenny. That was, that was really enjoyable. Um, I'm really interested in um, the, the bit that you said towards the end about mining and salt lakes. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm aware that, in the, at least in the Northern Territory, we have quite a lot of information uh, often about water birds in those salt lakes. But I'm just wondering, given that there is a lot of pressure um, certainly coming up and into the future to mine a lot of those lakes, um, how much other information we have so that we can link in with the 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 water bird data, which is often, you know, every 10 years or so we get a lot of water and they, the birds come in. How much other information have we got that we can link in to have a conversation about the importance of that biodiversity, in, particularly in those ephemeral or salt lakes? Well, I think we're poised on the brink of collecting a large amount of information from the sediments using metagenomics. But at the moment, we're just about to start a little proof of concept project because I've been out trying to get linkage partners and everyone says this is a great idea but we don't have any money and the price of iron has just you know, gone like that um, in terms of mining companies putting money in. Um, but we're going to try with um, some systems in WA where they've got good species lists 
um, to run a proof of concept to show that, look, if we can start looking at what's in the sediments, um, we're going to build up um, our understanding of biodiversity in a way that we haven't been able to do it in the past. So I would expect that will happen within the next couple of years. We might um, draw that to a close. Um, before Jenny's presentation, she was saying to me how delighted she was to be, have been invited to give this talk. And I think I can say that we are all delighted, aren't we, that um, Jenny was invited because it was such a fabulous talk, um, Jenny, and, and giving us such a, an important perspective on the, on the ecology of arid Australia. So could you please join with me in thanking Jenny for her talk. Thank you.